set your mind to default You just can't undo Undo the harm caused Hello and welcome back to The Vegan Runner. This is part two of my Brighton Marathon recap and review. In this video we'll be focusing more on the race recap side of things, looking at the mile by mile splits, my nutrition and hydration plan, the gear that I wore on race day and the thing that could have derailed the entire race which I didn't even realise until I got home later on Sunday after the race. Part one was more of a review with lots of the course information and event info, so if you're running Brighton Marathon, you'll want to check that one out after this for a heads up on what to expect around the course, as well as the organisation around the event too. I'll leave a link to that video in the description of this one, but let's crack on with this race recap. So we'll start with the gear that I wore for race day. This was all tried and tested in training before the race, there was no surprises on the day. Um, starting with the shoes, I went for the Next% 2. Now in my training I tried the Alpha Fly, um, Hoka's Carbon X3 and the Next% 2 and I found the Next% 2 the most comfortable to run in and the lightest shoe overall. So I went for this one but you can check out my detailed review of all of those shoes plus an Alpha Fly versus Vapor Fly head to head battle in case you're on the fence like I was. Uh, moving up then, I also wore socks from Nike. These are the Nike Spark Lightweight Socks. Um, they're not the easiest socks to get on, but they are very comfortable. They're thin and I got on really well with them in training. So an easier choice there. Now moving up to the shorts and here's where I made a bit of a change from my last marathon. Um, in this one, I wore the two times U compression shorts and then these ready pink shorts by or Dio. Um, they're the clothing brand that make the park run tops now but if you're not familiar um, they're similar to the brand DHB who make affordable running clothing that's pretty decent quality and, and durable. Now, I chose to wear the two times U compression shorts because they have a huge back pocket. Now, during the Manchester Marathon I just wore the, the, the Dew shorts, the red shorts here and uh, they do have a zip pocket but it's quite small and they've got this small kind of key pocket at the front as well and kind of learning some lessons from Manchester taught me that I need to carry a few more gels with me. The zip pocket on the do shots big enough to carry about two gels maybe three at a squeeze but they kind of slop around a lot and bang against your leg when it's stuffed full and it just doesn't feel comfortable to run in so with the two times U shorts you can stuff four gels in that big back pocket and they sit really close to your body and don't move around. And that also freed up the other pockets on, on the do shorts for other things which I'll get into a bit later when we talk about the, the race day nutrition. So that's why I went for the kind of compression shorts and then the, the kind of normal race shorts on top. Now speaking of on top, I was wearing my running clubs colours vegan runners. If you're a plant-based runner, whatever your age or ability, head to veganrunners.org to check out this brilliant nationwide club that has regular runner meetups throughout the country, as well as a lot of support and friendship online with their Facebook groups. I can't rate the club more highly. I've met some brilliant people through it, including at the uh, Brighton Marathon weekend, so go and check it out. Right, back onto the gear. It was a beautifully sunny spring day, so I wore my Roka sunglasses. Review of those coming soon. So hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss that one. And then on my wrist, I was wearing the Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro. Recently factory reset. 
because over time a lot of features like maps and things have just stopped working and if like me you haven't reset your watch since you bought it and it's been a little while it might be worth doing. I've noticed a massive increase in battery life since I reset mine. So that's all the kit and the gear that I was wearing and then of course I was carrying the GoPro Hero 10 on a selfie stick. And that was it, race ready. So initial targets going into the training block way before Christmas 21 was a sub 250, maybe even a 245 marathon. Now unfortunately life got in the way for the first half of the training block and I didn't start running really consistently until about 10 weeks out from the race. Most of the online race time predictors were giving me something around three hours to three and a half hours so I adjusted my, my goals a little. My A goal was to come in at 2.55, my B goal was to get in under three hours and then my C goal was just to get across the line and finish. And you never know what's going to happen on race day, even with a great block of training behind you. Something can go wrong and derail things, but that is the nature of the beast. Hundreds of miles of training, hours of running, and it all comes down to that one morning. So going into the race, I knew it was hillier than Manchester. I had checked the elevation profile, and from speaking to people who'd run it previously, they all mentioned that the first sort of five to six miles are quite undulating, and then it flattens out. So with that in mind, my strategy going into the race was to stick with the sub three paces for those early miles, averaging around sort of six minute 51 mile, and then push on to something around a 2.55 pace from there on in. And with the exception of mile two, which had more downhill than up, that's pretty much what happened. 6.50 for the first mile, and then 6.40 for the second. 6.48 for the third and fourth, and then I felt like I was getting into the rhythm, so up the pace a little bit for the fifth mile at 6.41 pace. The quick second mile meant that I was already a fair way in front of the sub three paces, and I was now running with a smaller group who were aiming for a similar time of 2.55. Here are the splits for miles six to 12. You can see with the exception of mile 10, which had a fair amount of up and down, the splits are generally getting a little bit faster and here are the splits for miles 11 to 20. And now I had a pretty much kind of, I found the rhythm here and miles 15 to 16 had a little bit more elevation though, so it was a little bit slower there. And then 17 had a bit more downhill, so that's why that one's a little bit quicker. Now miles 21 and 26 is where they say the training run is done and the race begins. I still felt pretty strong. There was a smaller but still pretty consistent group of runners around me and we were helping each other get through those last miles. Now by miles 23 to the end, that group really thinned out. I saw a lot of people kind of pulling up with cramp and generally just like hitting the wall. It's a really brutal part of the race and by those last few miles, I just tried to dig deep and hold on to that pace. I knew I was going under free. I knew I was very close to getting a PB if I could just hold on. And after running that stretch of the course on a Friday, I knew it was generally flat and I just needed to cling on and keep that rhythm steady. So here are the splits for the last few miles, generally holding a pretty consistent pace. Now what the splits don't tell you is that I felt like I was sprinting for most of mile 26. Apparently I got up to a five and a half minute mile at one point. My heart was pounding in my chest and trying to film that last stretch was a bit of a struggle. Now there was a guy in blue just ahead of me on that final stretch. I could see him a long way off and I felt like I was reeling him in. So that was a great motivator. And I just got ahead of him with about 50 to 100 meters to go and cross the line with an official chip time of two hours, 55 minutes and 40 seconds. It's always quite hard to tell what your exact time is when you cross the finish line, especially if you're a bit of a plum and forget to stop your watch like I did. I know the clock was under 2.56 when, when I came across the line, but I just wasn't sure how long at the, it took at the start to get across the line. So I had a bit of an anxious wait for the official results to update and get my chip time. Very happy with a new PB and hitting my A goal and running sub three again, proving that my first marathon wasn't a fluke. And with less than consistent, you know, less than consistent start to the training block, so overall, really happy with how the race went and feel like I learned some lessons from Manchester 
and put them in practice for Brighton. These lessons were mostly around nutrition, which I'll go into in just a second, but I felt like my pacing was a lot more consistent this time around than Manchester. And actually, it kind of definitely was, and I'm pretty sure I narrowly negatively split the marathon too. So that was, that's quite a positive thing and a nice thing to take away. And I think it was partly because of one probably obvious but important difference this time around. Um, you'll probably already do this, but I'm a little bit slow on the uptake. So now, because I had to reset the Garmin back to its factory settings, I had to play around with the data fields that the watch displays and had a kind of light bulb moment whilst doing it. So I like having six data fields on the watch, um, the usual sort of overall time, distance, average pace and heart rate data. But the other two data fields I changed to display the lap distance and average lap pace. And this meant I could glance at my watch, let's say a quarter of a mile or so into the lap and see what my average pace was for that mile and then adjust my pace accordingly. And this meant I had a much better idea of how fast I was going mile by mile as opposed to just using the total average uh, pace as a guide and waiting for the mile marker to arrive to kind of gauge how fast the last mile was. And then I think the next step on from this and what I learned from Brighton was that I should figure out how to take off the auto lap feature off of the watch and uh, just put it on like manual lap really. So again, apologies if this is really obvious to you, but I'm hoping this helps someone as clueless, clueless as me. Now, GPS distance and actual course distance tends to drift over the course of a race. So things like open water and tall buildings and weaving through crowds and all that kind of thing can affect the GPS. So it's not always 100% accurate. And what that usually means is that the GPS thinks that you've run a little bit further than you actually have. So more often than not, I'd hear my watch beep, look down, see the sort of split, and then look up and I'd see the mile marker coming up. So to start off with a few seconds later, and then as the course went on, it was sort of drifting further and further away. And then by mile 20, um, it was going off like 20 or 30 seconds before I actually saw the marker on the course. So if you go into your watch settings and then turn auto lap off, it won't automatically start a new lap when the GPS reaches a mile. And then you can press the lap button when you go past the mile marker to get a much more accurate split. I haven't figured out how to change this on my watch yet, but that's what I will definitely do for my next marathon. I think if I had done that for Brighton, I would have gone under 255 because I knew the splits that I needed to achieve for that and I could have just pushed it a touch harder to dip under at that time. But hey ho, another valuable lesson learned. Okay, right, nutrition. Okay, so in the days leading up to the marathon, I tend to kind of like load up on nitrates in sort of all aspects of my diet, lots of leafy greens and just lots of generally very clean food. Um, but I also like to get a boost from these beat it beetroot shots and I had two of these before the race as well. Also before every long run in my training I almost always have a breakfast of porridge, seeds, fruit and jam and that was the case at Brighton and then I tried something a little bit different for this race. I, I knew it was a fair walk from our Airbnb to the start and then there's a little wait around so I carried a one litre bottle of water with me and I sprinkled in some active root sports drink powder uh, I think it was peppermint and ginger flavour. And this is designed to, to settle your stomach whilst also topping up the salt, the sugar and the, you know your hydration levels. So I drank about half of this before the race and I would do it again for my next marathon as well. I just, just sipped it as and when needed as I was walking to the race and I got to the start line feeling energised and ready. So I went to the race with five gels, four Morton gels and one high five gel. I'd used these gels before in the training, so I knew what to expect from them. Make sure you try your race day nutrition in training, everybody. It really does pay off. Now the high five gel, I took about 10 minutes before the race started. And then the plan was to have a gel roughly every 35 to 40 minutes or so, or about every five miles. So I had my first Morton gel at around mile four, and then the next one at about nine and a half miles. Then another Morton gel at about 15 miles, and then 20 and 21 at some point of the course I actually picked up another high five gel at an aid station. I was going to save this as a sort of just in case gel for the last few miles but I had issues getting it into the zipped pocket of my do shorts and 
ended up carrying it and then taking it a little later on. So from miles 20 to 26.2, I actually didn't feel like I needed anything. So I didn't have that, um, that extra gel and I crossed the line with a spare Morton gel in my pocket. So that was all good. Now I took water from every station up to mile 20, sometimes water and an energy, energy drink as well, if they were handing them out. They were served in paper cups, which as I mentioned in part one of the video was really tricky to drink from whilst running. So the amount of water I was getting from each of the sort of water stations varied from, from station to station across the course. The last six miles, I didn't take anything on except for a caffeine strip by a brand called Unived. If you've tried the energy strips by Revy's, you'll know what to expect here. It's a very, very thin sheet of stuff, mostly caffeine that kind of like dissolves in your mouth. I only ever take these in marathons just for that little caffeine boost at the uh, sort of later stages of the course. And the day before the marathon, I was chatting to the guy from a brand called Striker, which is a fairly new um, UK based sports nutrition brand. And he mentioned that caffeine was good at masking pain a little in, in endurance events towards those sort of latter stages. So I was planning to take this with me anyway, but kind of held on to that advice in my mind. And when the race like started to bite, I took the caffeine strip. I think it was around about mile 22. And um, it's kind of good as a, a, as a mental distraction, but also for the performance boosting effects that caffeine has supposed to have. Now I wouldn't change much about my race nutrition or my nutrition on race day. That was, you know, the things that were in my control I think went really well. Ideally I would have taken on a bit more water but I finished strong so no complaints there really. The only thing I would say is that if it was much hotter or if you're running a summer marathon, I would have struggled to carry all of those gels without wearing that extra layer. I sometimes see people wearing those belts to carry gels. If that's you, let me know how you get on with them. As carrying a camera in one hand, I only have the other three for nutrition, so that's not really an option for me. I've seen those gel belts, but I don't know how comfortable they are, so if you could let me know down in the comments, that would be great. Now for the bit I couldn't have predicted, and it could have derailed my entire race, and I didn't realize until I got home from the marathon. If you watch part one of this vid, you'll know that I had to do a quick number change on race day right before the start so I could get myself into the right wave. So I grabbed my new number, a few safety pins, and went about taking the old number off and putting the new number on. All well and good, and I made my way to the start line, no problems. Then, standing around at the start, I started to feel like a slight sharp scratching coming from around the sort of undercarriage of my shorts. I thought, oh, maybe it was just sort of uh, pinching or some sort of tight kind of thing that just needed to be uh, do a bit of adjusting or whatever so a little bit of discreet <laughs> foraging around to try and find the source of the scratching um, and you know it wasn't constant so I thought nothing of it and it kind of subsided so you know and then the race started and, and we were off and I sort of completely forgot about it so it wasn't um, until 12 hours later I had thought nothing of it and then I was unpacking my gear for for the washing empty the pockets of my shorts all the gel wrappers and things and then something shiny caught my eye from the liner inside the red shorts. An open safety pin. Now it had been sat there like that next to my gentleman's area for the entire race. I think it must have fallen off whilst I was swapping my numbers around and then, I don't know, somehow breaking the laws of physics, made its way into the bottom of my shorts somehow. And I had to laugh as I figured out what that slight scratching was at the start of the race and then started to think about what could have happened if it had moved at all during the race. It just doesn't even bear thinking about really. So for my next marathon, apart from double checking my shorts before the start line, I'll keep that nutrition and hydration plan the same and will change my watch to manual lapping to get more accurate split times. But apart from that, I don't think i would change a whole lot except for making sure the early days of the training are as consistent as possible. It really makes a massive difference and it's a confidence boost if, if nothing else. And trying to catch up in the final weeks of training was pretty stressful. I'll be running my next marathon race in the autumn, probably sometime around October. But next up, I'm starting to train for Race to the Stones, which is in about 10 weeks time and will be my first ultra marathon. 
100k or 63 miles of Oxfordshire along the ancient Ridgeway Trail. I can't wait for that and will endeavour to keep you all up to speed with the training for that as I transition to a new race distance and from the road to the trail. I'm excited for it and kind of equally terrified. It's completely out of my comfort zone and I have no idea what to expect. I can't wait. Right, I hope that has been helpful for you. Possibly not uh, the last bit about the safety pin in my, in my shorts, but if you haven't already, please hit that like and subscribe button and until the next one, be the best you.